Hello everyone, and welcome to our presentation on constructivism in the learning sciences. The learning sciences are a set of interdisciplinary ways of thinking about how students learn. Many traditional practices still employed in schools do not encourage deep understanding. For example, while cognitive science tells us that students need, students need to have an anchor point of previous knowledge to which they can relate new learning, students are often still given information of separate, disconnected pieces to be memorized and regurgitated. Why the focus on deep understanding? The learning sciences operate on a basic assumption that becoming an expert involves accruing deep knowledge. Facts and procedures are not enough. Experts are able to adapt and apply those facts and procedures to specific situations. Other key assumptions of the learning sciences include the necessity of creating effective school environments where students are able to participate in constructing their own knowledge, that every le lesson must begin with eliciting what students know and what they think they know, and that opportunities must be given to practice reasoning and problem-solving skills on real-world problems. The learning sciences include components of neuroscience, which is the study of the physical structures and functions of the brain. Functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI scans, are used to show which areas of the brain are active during different tasks. Different areas and levels of activity may be present in different individuals, depending on the task and even the culture of the learner. So, what are the implications for teachers? The correlation between brain activity and best practices for teaching is still not clear. Many scientists argue that supposed brain-based techniques are just general good teaching techniques repackaged as scientific revolutions. However, there is good evidence that our understanding of learning disabilities can be enriched by studying the brain. Helping children with learning disabilities is easier when their brains can tell us exactly where in the learning process things are going wrong. Brain-based education is also valuable in considering plasticity, the idea that there is some flexibility in how neural pathways develop in the brain, and that enriched, stimulating learning environments can enhance brain function for all students. One of the foundations of the learning sciences is constructivism. Constructivism is sort of like the crossroads where psychology, philosophy, and educational theory all intersect. At its most basic, it could be described as the theory that all knowledge is constructed by learners. Consequently, the most effective teaching practices are student-centered teaching that involves students in the knowledge construction process. Because constructivism represents the convergence of many disciplines, it can be difficult to pin down. Nevertheless, constructivists generally agree on two central tenets. Learners are active in, the, in constructing their own knowledge, and social interactions are important in this knowledge construction process. These two tenets are each foundational to different schools of constructivism, psychological constructivism and social constructivism. First, let's examine psychological constructivism. Following the groundwork of Piaget, psychological constructivists explore how learning occurs at the level of the individual. As individuals interact with the exterior world, they construct a sort of cognitive architecture with which to process all that input. Changes in the learner's environment will affect how this intellectual structure develops. Psychological constructivism is sometimes, con sometimes called solo constructivism because of its focus on individual intellectual development. Social constructivism, as the name implies, focuses on how knowledge is co-constructed in a social setting. While psychological constructivists follow Piaget, social constructivism is highly influenced by Vygotsky. According to this school, knowledge is culturally constructed and, therefore, culturally relative. It follows, then, that education is at least, in part, a process of enculturation. So what are the consequences of these theories for our practice as teachers? The application of constructivist principles to student learning yields several insights. First, it is important that students should be given authentic tasks to complete, ones that simulate the complexity of real-world problems. Overly simplistic tasks should be avoided. Next, social constructivists hold that since knowledge is constructed socially, interaction with peers is essential to learning. It follows that we need to always incorporate time and space for collaboration into our lessons. Students should be provided with multiple viewpoints, as authentic tasks and real-world problems are usually pretty complicated. 
Students also need to be taught to think metacognitively and be aware of their own knowledge construction processes. Fundamentally, every student must be in ownership of his or her learning, although the teacher is still ultimately responsible. One might wonder how constructivist perspectives are applied in the classroom. One commonly used teaching practice is inquiry learning. Inquiry learning was first introduced in 1910 by John Dew. It includes the following elements. The teacher presents a problem or a puzzling event. Students formulate a hypothesis and then collect data to test the hypothesis and draw conclusions. They then reflect on the problem or event. When using inquiry learning, remember that activities must be well scaffolded. There's also problem-based learning. Problem-based learning came from research in the field of medicine. Problem-based learning is student-centered learning through the problem-solving experience. Its benefits include that it is an active style of learning and helps students develop flexible knowledge that they can apply to a wide variety of problems. The benefits of inquiry-based learning and problem-based learning are as follows. Students develop a better conceptual understanding of material. It's also been shown that these students perform better on standardized tests. And they also develop stronger reasoning in problem formation skills and they become more self-directed learners. Another constructivist approach is cognitive apprenticeships. In this model, there are basically six main important aspects. Modeling, where students observe an expert. Students then receive support through coaching or tutoring. And then students receive conceptual scaffolding and articulate their knowledge. They then reflect on their progress and explore new ways to apply their learning. Benefits include that it facilitates higher order reasoning, encourages greater levels of retention, and it also encourages authentic activity. The last constructivist approach discussed here is cooperative learning. Cooperative learning is where the classroom is well organized in such a way to allow academic activities to be performed as a social experience. Some of the problems that exist are that sometimes socializing can take place uh, or can take precedence over learning, and students can value process and procedures over learning, and group members may support and or reinforce misunderstandings. It's extremely important to prep students for cooperative learning. Let's look at some of the ways that computers and technology can be used to enhance our education practices. In 2010, Canadians spent 18 hours a week online and 17 hours a week watching TV. That means that that's something that our students are already very interested in. But the problem is that most children read less when the TV is on more. Interestingly, TV can actually improve the literacy skills in young children, but it needs to be programs that are targeted to the age and stage of development that those kids are at. In 2008, studies showed that 79.4% of Canadian households own their own computer, so that means you can expect about four out of five of the students that you have to own one at home. Some of the good things about computers are that they're extremely well suited to inquiry-based learning in maths and sciences, and that students are already familiar and engaged in this kind of technology. It gives us an, uh, an ability to enrich teaching with video simulations and appeal to a broader range of learning styles to enhance our differentiated instruction. This is especially true if you use the programs that are already created for you, like iMovie, GarageBand, Photoshop, Wolfram Alpha, and more. But there's problems with computers too. When we encourage kids to be focused on one piece of technology, it discourages them from interacting with the other kids around them. So they miss out on interaction, conversation, and socialization skill building, which can be very important later in their life. Because their attention is divided between so many things, it also discourages them from learning to take different perspectives or to look at a broader range of ideas like is required to understand the plot or a theme and sequence of a book. It also gives a clear advantage to students who are at a higher uh, socioeconomic status because they will be more familiar with the tools that you're using to assess them. In the future, if you're going to use computers and you're educating, you have to make sure that the software you choose is open-ended, that it's encouraging of discovery and exploration, and that it teaches problem-solving and cause-and-effect relationships. And for younger students, make sure that you include interactive features like spoken directions rather than just a whole bunch of text that they have to learn. Constructivism in diverse classrooms. Inclusion of diverse perspectives lies at the core of the constructivist approach to teaching. The constructivist approaches target the social space in between learners whereby they can exchange their understandings, perspectives, and experiences. Thus, the specific context of each person's knowledge is irrelevant to the use of constructivist practices. In fact, it stands to reason that a diverse classroom would be an enriching environment for learning because of the range of knowledge represented. That being said, constructivist teachers should take note of the following arguments when considering their practices. 
Firstly, it is important to consider whether or not the students in your classroom have the prior knowledge necessary to learn a specific concept. Do certain students have more experience with this topic than others? Some concepts that are taught in classrooms conflict with students' experiences. This is why it is important to evaluate whether constructivism is the right approach to teaching specific concepts given the experiences of your students and the nuances of the concepts. The next is a cultural dilemma. In order to ensure that constructivist practices do not disadvantage students in your classroom, as a teacher, it is important to understand the social dynamics that exist both within your classroom and that your students experience within society. For example, it is possible that the contributions of English language learners would be undervalued during group work activities if they are undervalued as individuals in your classroom due to their linguistic proficiency or cultural differences. The social dynamics of the classroom should inform your teaching your inform the teacher's facilitation of social-based learning activities. The final point for teachers to consider is a pedagogical dilemma. In the context of classrooms that are working towards the Ontario Secondary Diploma, it is the duty of the teacher to assign a grade to each student. Constructivist practices encourage teachers to either delay their judgment of students' contributions or to distribute the authority to judge student work to the class. This becomes an issue in that students receive less feedback from the teacher who is ultimately responsible for their grade. For this reason, constructivism often ends up hiding the authority of the teacher rather than genuinely reducing it.